Happy to have Tamar with us tonight to explore the history and stories of Ohio Stadium at 100 years. So I will turn it over to, to Tamar. Thank you so much for uh, giving tonight's presentation. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you all very much. And to those of you uh, uh, on Zoom, hello. Um, I also want to uh, introduce uh, Kevlin Hare, who's also going to be here. Uh, she's our assistant university archivist. Uh, if you have old OSU material that you don't know what to do with, she's your woman. She is the one who brings in all the stuff into the archives. So we work together on a wide variety of things. So we're going to give this presentation about the stadium at 100. Uh, we're just over 100, of course. Um, with the change of into January. And then after the presentation, we have some artifacts here out, um, various things related to the stadium. For those of you on Zoom, you'll have to come to the archives and see them. Uh, but everybody else, after you're welcome to come up and, and turn through pages and, and take a look at stuff as well. Um, I also want to say if people, I know we're going to have a Q&A at the end, but sometimes I talk about this uh, history of the university a lot. Uh, and so if I say something that makes sense to me but not to you, please stop me. Um, or if you have a question about one of the slides or something like that, uh, you know, don't, don't hesitate to ask a question. I guess I should go back. So in uh, early 1920s, the university decided that maybe we should do something about where we were going to play football on campus. Uh, so this is going to cover a little bit about how we got to the university deciding to build the stadium and then what happened after that. So you can see a lot of t different pictures of the stadium in construction. But before Ohio Stadium, we played at Ohio Field. Now, does anybody know where Ohio Field was? I see nods. Susan? <laughs> where? Woodruff and High Street, exactly, yes. So the corner of Woodruff and High Street, if you're familiar with campus and you know where the ARPS parking garage is, uh, or ARPS Hall, it was basically where the parking garage is now. Uh, they have sort of landscaped it, so it's supposed to look like a football field. I mean, you can judge for yourself. But that's, what, that's where the university first, uh, on campus, first played football. Uh, we dedicated it in 1908. Uh, we played on the field for a while before we actually dedicated it. I'm not sure why. Maybe they weren't sure it was going to hold. Um, but this is what the field looked like. You can see here um, various people standing outside waiting in line to go into the game. And before 1910, it was fine. Ohio State played football, but it wasn't a big sport. Um, it's not even the oldest sport on campus. Uh, so the capacity for Ohio Field was completely fine. Now, this changed when this man came to campus. So Chick Harley actually started at Ohio State in 1915. He had been a star at East High School, and he brought all of his fans to Ohio State to come to football games. People who had never considered going to see the Buckeyes play decided what they really wanted to do was see Chick play. Um, and so he played for Ohio State in 1916 and 17. Uh, he did not play in 1918 because he uh, was part of the um, Army and then in, came back in 1919. And this became a problem because people had to figure out where to sit. Now you can see <laughs> that picture on the left that people were climbing the trees. Now, this is where when I'm talking to undergraduates, I say, don't try to do that <laughs> in the current stadium. I don't think there's any trees close enough. But um, obviously, that I mean, I, I'm sure you got a great view. Maybe not the safest thing, but 
I don't know. I guess now they'd probably put a hammock in there. Um, but realizing this was not going to work, right? If we're going to continue to have football fans coming, th this small little tiny stadium uh, is not going to work. So I always like to mention these three men because they're sort of the people that, from the university's perspective, really thought, we got to do something else and we're going to go big, right? Sort of this, if you think about Ohio State now, everything we do is big. But at the time, early, you know, late 19 teens, right before 1920, the idea of something as large as Ohio Stadium, and we'll talk about that in a second, was a little out there. And some people thought they were nuts. Now, the three people, of course, is President William Oxley Thompson, who's our longest serving president. He was president from 1899 to 1926. Thomas French, for whom French Fieldhouse is named, he was the chair of our athletic board. He was also a professor. So you may not know, and this still exists today, that there is an athletic board on campus. It is a university senate committee, um, and it is run by the faculty. Um, their power over time has changed. They had a lot more power then than they do now. That's a different story. We can talk about that another time. Um, and then the person on the, I guess that's the right, uh, is Lynn St. John. And Lynn St. John was our athletic director. Um, and he is the person for whom St. John Arena is, is named. They decided we should build a stadium that is six times as large as Ohio Field. Again, people, when they heard this idea, thought, these people are crazy. We will never fill this stadium. And so there was a lot of question of what to do next, but they insisted that this was the way to go. And what they needed was an architect to kind of decide, all right, this is the university wants something this large. We've got to figure out what, what it's going to look like. Most of the other uh, stadiums at the time were made out of brick. How are we going to build it? Were we going to build it brick? If not, what we're going to do. So enter Howard Dwight Smith, who was one of the university architects at the time. And he's the one who took their ideas and actually put them on paper. Um, you know, some people consider him sort of the father of the stadium in terms of just, again, taking those visions that people had and actually designing it into what we know today is the, um, is the horseshoe. Um, it was open in the south end. Uh, because we had to have a track for the track team, a uh, straightaway uh, that would be long enough. And you'll see in some of the pictures how that came to be. And the idea was it was going to hold 63,000 fans. Right? I think we're up to 102. And there are people are still saying they can't get seats or can't get tickets. Um, but 63,000. Um, and they just, again, people were like, what? How is this going to happen? But we did. The one thing I'll also say about Howard Dwight Smith and the design of the stadium is it is on the National Registry of Historic Places, um, the original stadium. Uh, it is because of the fact that it was the first double deck horseshoe stadium in the country um, and made out of concrete and steel. So it's on the National Registry. So after much debate, the athletic board, the board of trustees, everybody agrees we're going to build this stadium, but we're not going to ask the state of Ohio to pay for it. Um, so we got to find money. Um, and so because of that, um, we create what's known as the stadium campaign. It's very interesting if you look at the literature about the stadium campaign. One of the words that's hardly ever mentioned is football. One of the things they talked about was getting the youth of America ready. Um, there was sort of a feeling after World War I that maybe the um, people, uh, the soldiers weren't quite ready enough. So the whole idea of physical fitness was built into the campaign to raise what they wanted to raise was a, were, was a million dollars in 1920 20, through 1922. Um, so a team of businessmen and alumni headed the campaign, uh, and it started an Ohio Stadium week. One of the other things that they played off of was the idea that the university was 50 years old in 1920. Uh, we were founded in 1870, so in 1920 we were 50 years old. So 
let's build this up. Um, and you can see here, there's some pictures. There was a, uh, a stadium campaign parade downtown. All of both the athletic teams, but any of the clubs, including the female students, marched in the parade. Again, it's about physical fitness of our student body, regardless of if they're men or women. And so everybody was involved. It was a huge amount of work to get people um, there. They also, there's letters from President Thompson to the students and alumni and the general populace. Uh, in both Ohio, but also elsewhere in the United States, um, asking people to come and donate money to, to build the stadium. Um, the final cost of the stadium was approximately $1.3 million. Um, there was a million dollars was pledged. Uh, we didn't quite collect everything. Um, we were short about $200,000, but uh, the bonds for it were paid off in the first five years of the stadium. So it, it all worked out all right. Um, I think one of the things, I don't know, that's not maybe the right, mm, you can't really see it. You can kind of see it here in this top, in the top of the left picture, this idea of the horseshoe being a magnet. And so in some of the literature, you can see that it was considered a magnet to draw people to Columbus. Um, and so that's part of the theme that goes throughout the entire campaign. The other thing you can see in, in this building on the left is what was called the armory. Um, the armory was basically where the Wexner Center for the Arts is now. Um, and on it, they had the huge um, sort of placard. And when a uh, part of the either the student body or a county in Ohio reached its goal, they would color it in. So that, you know, sort of similar to you see um, when there's fundraising campaigns and there's the thermometer, right? And they keep going, it's the same idea. Um, but it was out there present. We have to remind everybody that this is what we're gonna do. So while the group was making money, Howard Dwight Smith and the student uh, architecture students we're working on the design. So you can see here a couple of pictures. They created a, like a um, model of what it was gonna look like. And you can see some of the architecture staff and students working on that. And then construction begins in 1921. So the campaign starts in 20 and in 1921, um, we start actually building the stadium. Um, I'm just going to read this here because I want to make sure I get this right because the numbers to me are amazing. To build the stadium, it, was, it took 75,000 barrels of cement, 60,000 tons of gravel, and 30,000 tons of sand just for the, uh, just for the stadium. The other thing was, of course, the infrastructure was steel. And so... By April of that 1922 time period, 4,500 tons of steel were put into place to build the framework for the, con for the construction. So it really was you know, something that they didn't know if it was going to hold. They didn't know how well the concrete was going to hold up, but they, you know, they went for, for it. And here are just a couple of extra pictures of the construction. You can see it kind of how it all came together. I like this picture because you can kind of see what the area surrounding the stadium looked like at the time. In particular, again, um, when I've talked to students about it and they say, but where is, and they always bring up a building. <laughs> I say, well, it's not there yet. It, it'll come. <clears throat> the, um, I don't know if this has a pointer. Let's see. Oh, no. All right. Anyway, the no, it's okay. The buildings right to the left here on the bottom, those are all agriculture buildings. Just if you're wondering. And these are some of the workers who uh, were actually painting the seats. The numbers on the seats. You do know originally the way we got more people in the stadium was to shrink the size of the seats, right? So. 
There's a construction almost. It's getting there. We have a field and goalposts. Students playing a game right outside. And there's very close to opening day. The reason I like this picture is that you can see the track where the track was going to be put. Um, until the most recent renovation of the stadium and the uh, building of Jesse Owens Stadium, the men's and women's track team uh, ran track in the stadium. Um, and so that, that was the case from 1922 until 1999. Now, before we were, it was completely done, um, we still had two football games before the dedication. Uh, we played Ohio Wesleyan and Oberlin. We won both games, which was good. Um, October 7th, and then the second one was October 14th. 1922, yeah. And there you can see the team going out for practice. You can see there on the top right that the tower's not quite <laughs> done. But we get, it's done in time for the dedication. Now, the dedication was October 21st, 1922. And to prepare for these big festivities that were going to include governors, from both Ohio and Michigan, because we were playing the University of Michigan in the dedication game. There were going to be dignitaries. There was going to be a parade. Um, President Thompson and the Board of Trustees and the faculty went and cleaned the stadium with brooms. Because if you're going to have all the big wigs, you got to make it look nice, right? Um, so that's what's going on there, is the, them getting ready for the stadium dedication the next day. So there's the sta stadium dedication program. We have a copy of it here if you want to look at it. In anticipation, there were so many people. Remember I said there were 62,000 seats? They had 72,000 invitations for people that wanted to come. <laughs> so they had to figure out where to put 10,000 extra. So you can see in this picture that they added the South Stands that very first year for those 10,000 extra people. Now the South Stands, came, had to be taken down every year so that you could run track. Um, but even from the beginning, we were oversold. There's a, just a picture of during the game and then the pageantry before that, there was a 21 gun salute. We had a, um, a person who you would now think of as like a homecoming queen, her name was Eloise Fromm. She was known as the stadium girl. And so she was part of the pageantry as well and raised the flag. And there's, this is actually a panorama, um, panoramic photograph of that first game. It's, it doesn't come up quite as well on a screen, but uh, at the archives we have the actual, you know, longer one, so. Again, a reason to come to the archives. <laughs> now, unfortunately, we did lose that game to Michigan. <laughs> but, you know, we move on. Um, so, yes. Um, but from then going forward, of course, every year, new group come and, and play for the Scarlet and Gray. Um, we've had fantastic teams over time. We've had good seasons. We've had struggles. Um, but here are just some photos of events and, and not events, but games in the stadium over time. So some, these are from the 40s and 50s. Nineteen sixties, where we get our first color picture. So I had to throw one in. The thing about Ohio Stadium, though, to me, that is, makes it more than just a building is the pageantry and everything else that surrounds the game. So I have a few slides over the other things that happen related to um, what happens exactly on the field. And of course, part of that's the marching band. Um, 
I'm going to look this up because if I tell you, it's going to be wrong. All right, so the marching band actually started as a military band. Its first concert was in 1879. And by 1914 at Ohio Field, they were performing as part of the football games. Uh, so certainly in 1922, they started performing at the stadium as well. Script Ohio is maybe their most famous uh, formation, and that started in 1936. One of the other things that happened with the transition to Ohio Stadium was that the students decided we needed a yell cheering squad. They were called the Yell Squad. And we had some of them before the stadium, but not as um, sort of organized, I guess I would say. And so there were six men um, who acted as the cheerleaders that first year in 1922. Um, they were called the Gentlemen of the Cheer, and they did perform in jackets and ties, which I think is kind of amazing. Um, the first women's cheer squad was established around 1938, we don't have the exact date uh, of that, or we haven't been able to find it, um, but they were a separate cheer squad from the men until much later. Homecoming is always something that in incorporates so much more than again, than, than just what's on the field. Uh, homecoming actually, the initial thoughts about homecoming starts in 1911. Um, Dr. Schindel Wingert, who was actually director of athletics and director of student health at the same time, um, he made an effort to bring alumni back to campus for a football game. And then that's kind of in 1912 is when it starts to be considered homecoming. So just a few pictures of that. Now I mentioned Eloise from, she's uh, right there on the left and, and that's her in 1922 at the dedication. Our first official homecoming queen uh, was elected in 1923. And then the middle there is Marlene Owens, um, now Marlene Owens Rankin, who was our first African-American homecoming queen in 1960. If you're able to come to the exhibit, Marlene generously donated her homecoming trophy um, to the archives, and you can see that at the exhibit as well. There are other traditions, just to th throw a few out there. Um, if you see on the left, there's the victory bell. Now the service fraternity, Alpha Phi Omega, um, are the ones who started and continue to ring the victory bell after any um, football win. It was actually a gift of multiple classes, uh, student classes, in 4344 and 1954, and it was added to the stadium in 1954. Now the group on the right, is uh, members of Bucket and Dipper, which is the, well, it still is, the Ohio um, OSU's junior honorary. They and the University of Illinois' honorary decided that they would have a competition um, between the two schools as to who would win. Now, you might be saying, Illinois, why are we having a competition with University of Illinois? In the 20s, it was a big deal. Illinois was a good football team. Um, and so we, <laughs> we actually, and we still do pass a wooden turtle back and forth between the schools. Uh, the school that wins gets to keep the turtle. Um, it started as a real turtle, but after a couple of years, the fraternity decided that wasn't a great idea. And so it became wooden. And we're lucky enough to have one of them in the archives. It's also on display. Um, but you can see here, when it fills up, so it's carved with the score, when it fills up, whoever won that last game gets to keep the actual turtle, and then the next year they get another one. So, and of course I had to throw Brutus in here. Uh, Brutus first appeared in home, at the homecoming game in 1965. You can see his original look on the left there, a big nut with legs. Um, he was 40 pounds. Uh, fire, uh, well, at first he was paper mache and then he became fiberglass. And when he was fiberglass, he was 40 pounds. Not easy to, you're not gonna see him like doing push-ups, right? Um, or running or really anything. Um, and so he goes, the Brutus uh, changes several times. Um, this most recent look and the one he has now uh, is settled on in about 2001 of what he is today. One of the other student groups, of course, is Black O. If you've seen the card stunts, either if you've been at the game or on TV, 
um, they're the ones responsible for it. And uh, they were founded in 1938. They have grown to not just do football games, they do they cheer at other games, games other sports as well. Um, but I love this picture of them meticulously figuring out if we wanna make a W, who, what seat, right, is gonna have to do what color. Um, I wanna say a year or so ago, we had one of their current students who looked at this picture and said, it's not exactly the same, but it's pretty similar <laughs> to what they do now. I think there's more computers involved, but um, so pretty similar. Now I mentioned the pageantry, of course, surrounding the football games and everything else, but there's been more than football in the stadium. Um, in 1932, our Dean of Men, Joseph Park, came up with this idea of a way to help students who were unable to afford continuing to live uh, close to campus and continuing to go to the university and decided that we would create a cooperative dorm underneath the stands in the stadium. Um, and you can see that that's sort of a drawing on the left, but you can see the idea that it's literally under the seats of the stadium. Um, the picture on the right, it's maybe a little bit hard to see, but they were set up like barracks, um, rows of bunk beds. Um, students were required to work in the dorm in exchange for uh, less expensive housing, you know, room and board. Um, so they would cook, they would clean, anything related to helping in the service of the dorm. Um, can't remember what I was going to say right after that, but yes. All right. So the, the dorms are not still there. Um, so eventually the dorms did be, become more traditional dorms as opposed to these barrack style um, where they had real walls and things. Um, and then in the Renovation in 19, the 1999 to 2001 renovation, they took all those out. Yep. But it was always, sorry. Um, the dorms were used from uh, 19, I think the first students were 1934. Yeah, 1934. And then they closed in 2000. Yep. And they were always considered a scholarship dorm. So in addition to having to work, you did have to have a, a grade point. One of the things that when we were doing the um, sort of research for the exhibit on the stadium that I read were letters from parents saying how much it meant to them to have their sons in the in those dorms. Um, there's a fantastic one that went to the president where where the mother said, "I'm, you know, I'm a widow. I would have had to pull him home. I don't know what he would do." Right? We don't want people going out into the workforce. This is the depression. <laughs> Um, and so she was talking about how important it was um, for him to stay. And it's, uh, it was really nice. And there, we have a, the letter back from the president to her saying um, how glad he was that her son had seen that this was so beneficial to him. So, so pretty neat. We've had other sports. Of course, I talked about track and field. Um, but we've had other, other sports as well. So we've had um, field hockey, lacrosse. Soccer, that's another uh, field hockey picture. We also had a something called the Stadium Theater. So the theater began underneath the East Stands in the summer of 1950, and they put on Broadway shows underneath the stadium. Um, they were, I'm gonna make sure again that I'm uh, looking at my notes that I get it right, that they could seat about 300 people so not bad. It became kind of a pain. Once again, remember, this is a thing where you have to put it up, take it down, put it up, <laughs> take it down. Um, and then when Drake, the Drake Union opened and we had a more of a theater department there, that's when they decided we're done. So the last one in there um, was 1968. So not too, not too bad, 18 years. And then, of course, more recently, after the stadium was no longer um, grass, we allowed um, entertainers and other uh, bands to come. Um, the first uh, concert was a Pink Floyd concert in 1988. And that's a picture from that concert. Now, since 1928, spring almost every spring commencement has been held in Ohio Stadium. 
Uh, the only times in that time since then it hasn't is 1929, which for some reason we had at the fairgrounds. And then during the renovation um, from 1999 to 2001, it was held on the Oval. So, so it kind of ties you together, right? So that's the thing about the stadium is that you may never go to a football game, but you've somehow been a part of the stadium, either by just walking by it. It's the middle of campus, right? I mean, it's not on the Oval, but it's pretty darn close. Um, or if you graduated from there, you know, there's something about the stadium, even if you do not care about football at all. So about five years ago, looking at the calendar, I decided we should probably do something because the stadium was gonna be 100 years old. Um, so there were a number of different events um, in the fall, but we also created the um, stadium exhibit, which is in Thompson Library. Here's just a few things that you can see if you come. The exhibit will be on display until the end of February. February 26th is um, when we will take everything down and it is going to be something else at that point. Um, but it's on the main floor. If you come in from the oval and you just go straight, it's, it's right there on your left. The other thing you can see if you come to the stadium exhibit is our Lego stadium. So Dr. Paul Jansen, who is a professor at the Ross Hart Hospital, um, for fun, created a Lego stadium that's eight feet by 10 feet. It is huge, it is super cool. Um, and it's hard to tell, but in order to put little people in, he can actually uh, take out the piece of the field in the middle and crawl underneath the platform we created for him. Um, our two exhibit preparators uh, said that it was the most nerve wracking thing they had ever done was move it from his house to the Thompson Library um, because they could hear pieces falling. There's no glue involved. There are no special pieces. They're all regular pieces that you can buy in a regular Lego set. Um, if you come to see the exhibit, you'll notice that he actually put in a new field just before the Michigan game that has the marching band on the field in the script Ohio formation. So, and you can try to figure out where your seats are and take a picture. Some are easier than others. Yeah. It's on display in the hospital lobby for a while. It was, so it was on display in the Hart Hospital. That was the first time he ever displayed it. He has also displayed it at the Columbus Museum of Art. Sometimes they have those, that big Lego um, exhibit. They he's done it there as well. We were hoping the Museum of Art would want it next so that they could transport it. Um, but it doesn't look like we're gonna be lucky enough to have that happen. So. This is just sort of the contact info and information. I also have my card up here if you want uh, after this. Um, thank you. What questions do you have? Um, I have a comment and a question. Yeah. I'll do the. It, it's my understanding, as far as fundraising, there is a bit of a tie into the Bexley community that uh, two of the biggest benefactors were the Lazarus family mm -hmm. and uh, Leo Yazinov. Um, they were some of the biggest contributors towards that. So when you say contributors, what do you mean? Financial contributors yeah. or yes? So we had a group of contributors that gave five thousand dollars, some more. Um, and then we also, though, had a group that were very influential in terms of the campaign. Oh, okay. um, so, for example, Simon Lazarus was in charge of the publicity part of the campaign. Um, so it somewhat, um, Charles Summer was involved as the chairman of the campaign. So, yes, absolutely, 100%. Uh, the Bex community was very involved in particular the campaign. I'd have to go back and look at numbers in terms of financial contribution, but to me, Yes, the financial contribution is important, obviously. But the fact of rallying, particularly the city of Columbus, around this and organizing, this was the first time the university had ever done a fundraising campaign. And those of you who are alums know that every single, well, maybe not every single day, very often you will get campaign, you know, we're having a campaign. This was the first time we'd ever done it. We had no idea what we were doing. And somehow we pulled it off. And it was really because of those men. My question uh, is, I, I thought there were problems with the location because of the river, 
Uh, weren't there p problems locating it so close to the Olentangy? Yeah, so they did, uh, they did mess with the river, and you know anything about rivers, rivers don't like to get moved. But they did slightly alter the course of the river so that they could put it there. Um, they've, we have pictures of the stadium being flooded. Like I said, sometimes the river wants to go back the way, the way, the way it wants to go. Um, now there are, I think, four or six pumps underneath the field to keep it dry. I have a question about the horseshoe shape. Yeah. Um, so this is unique to Ohio State, I think, to any other, like no other campuses have Ooh, this type no of? No other, I don't know. I don't know, if, but that, what makes, why the horseshoe shape? And, and Partially the, because of the track. Um, so we had to have an open end. Um, what I read about, um, because we had to have the, the straightaway for the track team, we had to have an open end that was long enough as opposed to a bowl. And the horseshoe allows for the initial um, seats to be closer to the field than if you did like, a, yeah, the upper deck. It, it, it helps in terms of seeing onto the field is what I've read that that's what Howard Dwight Smith said. Um, but the openness is because they needed, they needed the track. And if they had enclosed it to, to keep the length of the track, it would have had to be super long on that one side. So, yeah. We have a couple online. Yeah. Um, someone asked if there were any women in the dorms uh, for, in the stadium when they had those open. There were after 1975 or 76, yeah, but not initially. Someone was also curious as to if you knew how many Lego bricks approximately oh, were in those dear. models. <laughs> you know, you told me how many Lego bricks. Okay, so do we have that person's contact info? Because if, okay, if you can get it, I'll email you the information because Dr. Jansen has actually told me. I think it's approximate. I do know when he was building the top part. I don't know if you can see it. When he was building the, the upper deck, um, he didn't like the angle at first, so he spent four hours working on a segment of it, and he decided it wasn't good, so he took it all apart. He did say that that same section only took him an hour the second time because he had figured it out, but it, it's really quite incredible <laughs> if you get a chance. Um, it is designed like the current stadium, not the original stadium, so it has the ex extra pieces to it. One million bricks. Oh, there we go. Thank you. Yes, I should have been Google, tell me. Yeah. Uh, so that original 62,000, how did that compare to other universities? How ambitious was it? So I don't have the numbers, but um, like off the top of my head, but I do know that um, the sort of the East Coast um, brick stadiums were quite a bit smaller. What quite a bit is, I, I honestly, I'd have to do the research to tell you. Are they 40 to 50? Yeah, yeah. So about 12,000 more than some of the East Coast stadium. Peggy, or <laughs> So Tamar, there was a story that you and I talked about, and I don't recall if I remember the truth or just remember it in my way. Sure. <laughs> but that that committee, mm -hmm. that original committee, um, I understood had been charged with raising X amount of money for X number of seats. Oh. But in wow. fact, because everybody thought they were so nuts in the first place, <laughs> they increased that number. Okay. Did so you... I don't remember talking to you about that, but that is entirely possible. If you go to our website, we've, we've scanned all of our stadium camp. We have different subject files on different subjects related to the stadium. So it's possible I sent you a link and you read that, and I don't know. Right. I promise. That's the, okay, so. And that that was made sort of independently of a lot of the public activity. Um, because they would be perceived as being even more nuts <laughs> if they <laughs> then released they originally? a different number. But so you don't know that. I don't you? know that, but this is the one thing that I always say the difference between an archivist and a historian. A historian knows that off the top of their head, 
an archivist knows where to find it. So I can <laughs> help you by going back and looking. <laughs> Wasn't there a controversy over brick versus cement back then, which way to go? Because most all the stadiums were brick at that time. Yeah, so that's my understanding is that concrete, they, it was, most of the other, oh, all the other stadiums were brick. And this idea of doing something in concrete was part of the, you guys are nuts, why are you making it so big, and why would you ever not use brick for a stadium. So yeah, it was all incorporated in that. Are these people crazy or are we gonna actually fill this place and is it gonna hold up? And I do know, um, having talked recently to Gene Smith, that they spend a lot of money on upkeep because you know they just it's a very heavily used building, obviously. <laughs> so there's there's a lot of money that goes into upkeep of the stadium. Someone just asked if you had any personal favorite stories or facts of the building that, that you like to share uh, during visits at the university archives or that you've heard through oral histories. I can do one. You want to do one? Yeah. Is your mic on? Uh, is my mic on? OK. Well, getting back to the stadium dorms, uh, we did do an oral history interview of a gentleman who was there from 41 to 42, and then he entered the army. Uh, and he said it was actually great, uh, great practice for going into the army because they were barracks. You were on, you had a bed and you had a trunk, and you better get up and do your chores. And you know you had to pitch in with everything. And so uh, going into the military was a breeze. He said, <laughs> except for all the fighting, of course. <laughs> What was the size of the Mi of Michigan Stadium at the time when ours was built? So the when, interesting uh, thing about that was Michigan uh, built a new stadium right after we did. Uh, theirs was designed in 19, I think it was dedicated in either 1927 or 28. I don't know what the size of the one they were playing in at the time that we built ours. Um, theirs is currently larger than ours by a couple thousand. Um, but I'd have to go back. The archivist at Michigan and I are pretty good friends, so I could probably text him later if you want, and I could say. Probably there, right? It's probably, they have a really good um, sports website, actually. They have a sports archivist. It's one of those things that I keep dreaming of and I keep using and saying, well, Michigan has a sports archivist. Certainly, we should have a sports archivist. Um, but if you give me your email or your, your number, I will find out for you, okay? All right. Well, I just want to say thank you, Tamar, and thank you for bringing uh, these artifacts yeah. and for giving the talk tonight. It was wonderful. It was very informative. Uh, if For those in the room, if you have questions, uh, we'll keep the mic on. And then uh, if you want to come up and check out uh, what they brought from the archives, feel free to do so. All right. Well, thank you all so much. Appreciate it.